Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Aren't we blessed? Uh, praise be to God today. Thank you, choir. Thanks for blessing us today and, uh, and blessing our worship of God today. We, uh, we, we open the word of God today again uh, from the psalm now to, to 1 Timothy. So I want you to join me as we, uh, as we read along. It'll be there on the screen. Uh, we're into 1 Timothy now, and we've got um, Romans, then Luke uh, for the rest of the year. Uh, we've been doing the New Testament since January, and so uh, we read today from 1 Timothy chapter 4. If you put these instructions before the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with profane myths and old wives' tales. Train yourself in godliness, for while physical training is of some value, godliness is value in every way, valuable in every way, holding promise both, both for the present life and the life to come. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and struggle because we have our hope set on a living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. These are the things that you must insist on and teach. Let no one despise your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I arrive, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhorting, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. Put these things into practice. Devote yourself to them so that all may see your progress. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Continue in these things, for in doing this you will save both yourself and and your hearers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Open us now, O God, to your word and Holy Spirit, uh, that we, what we hear with our ears, we may, we may show forth with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. In this letter from the older Paul to his younger pupil, student, mentee Timothy. Uh, he is uh, giving a word to Timothy uh, as Timothy matures in the faith and in his calling. Uh, Timothy, and you can see it with these words, it's really a master to student here, uh, teaching uh, Timothy what it is to continue to grow as a Christian and, as, and particularly as a pastor. But uh, there are nuggets of wisdom here for all of us, even if you're not um, uh, called to be a pastor today. I want you to hear this as a person a called to be a Christian, uh, called to be a teacher, called to be a student, uh, called to be a worker, a worker in the kingdom. So, so we all hear this, uh, this word. We get to listen in on this word from, from Paul to Timothy. We get a little peephole into their relationship and to, um, and to who we're called to be. Apostle Paul uses here the language of, of training, of physical training, uh, the language of sport and athletics uh, to, to teach Timothy, to mentor him, to disciple him. This is, of course, while Timothy continues to lead a congregation himself. Um, Paul exhorts him to train him, him in godliness so that he can train others to do the same. What we know about high-level athletes is that there is an extraordinary amount of training that has gone in to make them the athletes that they are. They have a goal, the best ones have a goal to be the best, but simply wanting to be the best does not make them the best. We know that. World Series is on, college football is on. Those folks do not just wake up one day and decide to be uh, the best player at that, their position in the World Series. Um, the best players don't just wake up one day and decide, ah, I think I want to be the best third baseman uh, in the world. Um, they have trained for a lifetime to be the best, um, to, to work hard, to do what, what, what they have been made to do. Take it out of the uh, to take it out of the sports world. Not all of uh, not all of you are sports people. Uh, if you were at the symphony concert last night, um, I wasn't there, but I've heard that John Williams concert on Star Wars and playing all the music. If you were there last night, um, 
those violinists and trumpeters and percussionists and all those folks that showed up didn't just decide to show up tomorrow night and play all those things. They have tried for, they have worked hard for a whole life with that goal in mind to be able to order their lives around being the best at what they do. So the same be true for Christians. We cannot be part-time Christians and then expect um, uh, for, uh, for all of life to go well for us. We cannot be part-time Christians and expect us, ourselves to live the life that God intended. If we, experience, if we expect to experience the good life that God wants for us, we have to be full-time Christians, full-time training in righteousness and holiness. We order our lives inside and out to be more Christ-like because this is the highest value in life. This gives us the life that God intended for us from the very beginning. Without that goal, without that goal to live for Christ, we are wandering, we are purposeless, we are rudderless, we are running without an end in mind. The goal is life with Christ now and forever because this is the best kind of life. If you've had a sneak peek at that or a whole picture at that, you know this is the best life to live with Christ now and to live with Christ forever. And this is why Paul says here that the training in godliness, holiness, discipleship has a higher value than even physical training. Many of you will know the name of Deion Sanders. Deion Sanders is sort of a character. Um, this sermon is not about Deion Sanders, but I will say about Deion Sanders, um, they did win yesterday, uh, Colorado. Um, but Deion Sanders had a very interesting epiphany in his life. Um, Deion Sanders calls himself a Christian. Uh, Deion Sanders had a, an epiphany after a very successful uh, career, or during a very successful career in football. He was actually a professional baseball player for a while as well, uh, but he was a professional football player, and he had, uh, he was, he, as he describes it, he was just living for himself. He was living for fame. He was living for literal fortune. He was living for the bright lights for its own sake. And he pursued the, the end goal in mind of winning a Super Bowl, just like um, professional football uh, ball players all live for. He pursued that for its own end, and he describes, and Tom Brady and others describe the same exact feeling. Sanders describes that, that one of the darkest places in his life that came was when he finally won the Super Bowl. It's strange, isn't it? It's strange that he would say this is one of the darkest places, that's how he called it, the darkest places in his life because he says immediately afterward, um, I realized that that goal was not, the high, was not supposed to be the highest value for my life. It didn't serve the deepest pur purpose that I really was made for. And he, he looked back on that and he said, with, with God in his life then, it would have been enjoyable. But without God, the joy didn't last very long. The chase was over to get that Super Bowl and then what was left? He, at his own admission, had placed the value completely in winning for its own stake uh, for its own sake, instead of enjoying the life that God had given him, enjoying that God had made him, uh, created him uh, for, uh, for a good purpose. Instead of enjoying the life that God had given him, giving God glory in the midst of that, he, he discovered that that was, was, was not everything. The goal is this. We live life as it was meant to be lived. God created us for life now and for eternity and was meant to be lived in a Christ-like way for God's glory and our joy. So the Bible is teaching us today about that life and about how to live that life, the good life that God intended. 
Here's one way uh, one author described this, uh, this parallel with physical training Paul, that Paul employs here. Yeah, this writer says, quote, spiritual disciplines are like the exercises we do to improve our physical well-being. Some disciplines like running, which changes the physiology of the body, the, the muscles burn energy, the lungs expand to take an increased oxygen, the heart pumps harder, but over time, the muscles grow stronger. The lungs have more capacity. The heart's ability to pump blood increases. He goes on to say the runner did not directly will the muscles, the heart, the lungs to become better. The runner had the goal in mind and did the practices necessary along the way to increase the capacity to achieve that goal. I've shared before on this topic that Eric Liddell, the subject of the movie Chariots of Fire, real person, real story, and how um, he, uh, he was that long distance runner and he talked about this joy that, that he discovered when he, he did what he did for the glory of God and how he said, he, God made me to run and, and I'm fast and God helped made me to do that and, and when I run, I feel God's pleasure, he said. And then he went on to say, uh, it, it, was, it, is, it, it is as if if I didn't run, uh, God, I would be holding God in contempt. Right? Because God gave him the gifts to run. He can give God the glory that he has the gifts to, to, to run. It's like that. It's like that. It's like that. Spiritual disciplines um, help us to live the life that, that God intended. So let's say that a goal for you as a Christian, for us, um, and it is, a goal for us is to become a more loving person, okay? We cannot command our feelings to suddenly change and love, but we can choose to take the actions that will lead to that desired goal and result. We can ask God to change our motives, and then like a runner, we can begin a program of regularly praying, taking in God's word, worshiping God in a variety of ways. And over time, time, then, our heart begins to enjoy pleasing God and, and pleasing somebody else that we're trying to love. Like many runners begin to enjoy running, which sounds counterintuitive, right? It, 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 you have to work hard. You have to be disciplined. You often have to get up early. You got to sweat. You got to. But but as as we've learned in exercise, it's a strange thing that if you get yourself to doing it, it and you wear yourself out doing it, it actually it feels good. It feels good. You may be exhausted, but it was for a good purpose. It's a good tired, and that's how it is when we. We train ourselves to grow and to love well. We choose to serve others by doing things, loving things for them. And then if we haven't felt it yet, suddenly one day by habiting our way, if you will, or practicing our way, we realize that that we enjoy loving others and serving others and it becomes natural for us and we, again, we habit our way into it. Like running changes the body, your spiritual discipline, the, the, the habits that come, it, they change our character. Um, um, and, and we have to choose to keep those exercises going, those, those spiritual disciplines going so that, so that we can continue because uh, we are fickle people. Um, we have to act our way into Christian living, not because we always feel like, like it, Feelings are deceptive and fickle and fleeting. Too often um, we allow them to control us. We instead, we, we do the things the Bible teaches us before even we necessarily feel them. And then the doing of them shapes and molds our love. It's, it's so hard. It's so hard. Paul says to Timothy, we, essentially, we must habit and practice our way. Keep on doing the things that you have heard and received in me. Let's look at a little more at a couple of other parts of this section from 1 Timothy. 
Uh, there are these couple of phrases that are so interesting here and a little bit uh, mysterious. You call it early in the passage today two examples of challenging, uh, things that are challenges to our training as disciples of Jesus, challenges to the Christian life. For Paul, it was, to Timothy, it was one general challenge and one specific challenge. The general challenge was this, this piece of, quote, old wives' tales and profane myths. Be cautious, be careful about those things he wrote about. And by this, we need to know that Paul means any stories people tell that are misleading or not accurate or vulgar or what have you about Christians and the Christian life. Because then there were lots of stories that were circulated in Roman pagan idolatrous culture and these stories were told to discredit early Christians. Um, They told stories, negative stories about the Lord's Supper. They told negative stories about the way Christians cared for the poor. And so um, they they told all kinds of tales and, and so Paul is counseling Timothy to ignore those kinds of things. Uh, You may can think of things today, stories told, stereotypes, generalizations, accusations that are told about Christians. I'm going to fit in this category too. And Paul counsels Timothy to ignore those things. The second more specific myth and tale was that Paul tells Timothy here, hope you caught it, is this cultural habit then and now of marginalizing young people, young adults. Did you catch the passage there? Let no one despise your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct and so forth. This was likely something Paul was addressing to Timothy because it was happening in the church, in the church. Because in a culture then and now that values seniority among many, over many things, Paul says, do not allow people to look down on you because you're young, Timothy. You see, it might have been something that Timothy was battling against with the elders and the seniors in his church, maybe not taking him seriously, maybe marginalizing him as their pastor. But but Paul says, don't allow people to look down on you because you're young, Timothy, but the way you counter this is not by self-righteousness, but by your example. Let them see your speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. It's like Richard Rohr once said, And I love this. This is one of my favorite quotes. Father Richard Rohr said, the best criticism of the bad is the practice of the better. The best criticism of the bad is the practice of the better. So for Christians, we are not just critiquing the wrong. We are practicing a better way, a Christian way. It shows up in our speech, our conduct, love and faith and all the things that that Paul talks about here. So not just critiquing, but showing a better way. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 13 and 12 and 13 as he says, um, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. A more excellent way. Sometimes we say, let younger people have a voice, etc. You hear that. And while that has value, what the Bible says here is for younger people to set the example for all of us in speech and conduct, in love, faith, and purity. We should look around us in our church. If you go Wednesday night, Sunday night, all around, we have young people in our church that set the example for us of a passionate faith and we should look to them not simply as good examples for the future or isn't that so neat that they are who they are but as models for the present that teach us how to be Christian in the world for all of us Christian life for all of us Christian life involves growth and maturing and developing lifelong discipleship we never arrive at having figured it out. We never arrive, uh, uh, so to speak, at senior status for being a Christian. 
We are always training, always nudging, always growing, looking to others, maybe especially the young, to young Christians to see what it is they can teach us and certainly what we may teach them. The church is the training ground for all of us to grow in holiness and love so that others will see and want to know more about Jesus and his saving grace in our lives. Church is training ground for that. Too often we go halfway. We want to be kind of part-time trainers. Um, you don't get the World Series that way. Um, we we want to be part-time in. I sometimes think of it as the hokey po- the hokey pokey faith. You know, yeah, one foot in and one foot out. Right? Part-time. Part-time. But to live the life that God really wants us to live, he's got so much in store for us, so much gift and blessing. And to live that life, for us to be able to give our gifts and all the rest of it, to live that life, we have to have both feet in, full-time, training in righteousness. We never arrive. We've never got it all figured out. We are always growing and experiencing the joy of what it is to grow. We have to train for it. And in parallel, we're training for it while we're living it. So we're training and living, training and living all at the same time. Scripture, other scripture reinforces this as well. Um, here are a few of those. Hebrews 12, 11 says, all discipline, I love this one, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Hebrews 5, 14, but solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So we have to be trained to discern right, wrong, good, evil. That does not, despite what we may think, that does not always come naturally. It is not not natural for sinful human beings to know the difference between right and wrong. We have to be taught. We have to be trained. And if someone hasn't been taught and trained, it should not surprise us that there is not a knowledge of a difference between right and wrong, and we have to all be cha- trained for that. Proverbs 22, 6, you may know this one, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. We have responsibilities with children to train them up, and then children have a responsibility to continue to train themselves as they grow old. We train, we keep training all of our lives. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by, by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. There that language is again, training in the faith. Training in the faith. This is a bit of a difference between membership, discipleship. Now, being a member really means it's not like being a member in a country club or a civic club or something like that, which is, can be great. Uh, church membership, though, is, is meant to be, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ who is a member of the body of Christ of this community. That's what, it, that, that's what discipleship and membership really means. Being uh, a disciple and a member is one who is training together with others in the faith. Discipleship, training in godliness, speech, conduct, love, faith, purity. You know, the word discipline discipline and disciple are literally from the same root. Discipline, disciple. You can't have, dis, you can't have discipleship if, if you're not disciplined. Discipline, discipleship. The word disciple also literally means, you may know this, to be a student or an apprentice of something or someone. 
So the question for us maybe from the text today is, how teachable are you today? How open are you today? How coachable are you? Um, do you? Do we think we got it all figured out? And if everybody else would just like, you know, do, do you think you've sort of arrived at everything you need to know? Do you really feel like you've you sort of, you know, you, you've hit the end goal. Um, you got it. I got it. You know, I know. They don't. Whatever. Is, is that where you are? Or are you open? Do you have a posture that is receiving, receptive? Um, do you have a teachable spirit, coachable spirit? So what I appreciate about Timothy, he, he, is, he receives the teaching that the Apostle Paul gives to him, the mentorship, the, um, the, the teaching. He, he's, he's, a, he's already a pastor, he, but he knows he hasn't arrived. He, he hasn't just said, okay, now I've got the credentials. Now the hands have been laid on me. Now I've got the authority. Now everybody else needs to listen to me. He knows that even as he leads, he's first a follower. Beware of leaders who are not lifelong learners and who don't understand themselves as lifelong students that need to be mentored. Be wary of leaders who think they have it all figured out. Leaders, the best ones, are ones who are always learning, always students, always disciplined in their speech, conduct, love, faith, purity, This is what it is to be a Christian disciple. How teachable are are we? Remember what the Bible says today. Here's the wisdom about training discipleship. This This is what the Scripture says. One, devote yourself to the Scriptures. Two, neglect, don't, do not neglect your gifts. Beautiful. Devote yourself to the Scriptures. Do not neglect your gifts. Great quote ran across years ago about this, do not neglect your gifts. Um, uh, this quote is about finding Christian friends in your life, um, how we need a Christian community and Christian friends who, um, it says, the quote is, uh, you need Christian friends or Christian commu- community who hates the sins that you love and loves the gifts that you ignore. You need people in your life who despise the sins that you love and helps you not to ignore the gifts you have. Loves the gifts that you ignore. So devote yourself to the scriptures. Do not neglect your gifts. You all have gifts. God has given you gifts. No excuses. You are blessed. You have more wonderful gifts than you ever imagined. Do not neglect your gifts. And then third, Scripture says, watch your life closely. Watch your life closely. So read the Scriptures, embrace your God-given gifts, live them, and keep watch over your life. Self-reflect, humility, watching out for temptation, keeping watch. Scripture talks about that a lot. Um, Humility, all the rest of it. Devote yourself to Scripture. Do not neglect your gifts. Watch your life closely. Practice our way into the faith. Train it our way into the faith. I used to get so, so annoyed in high school when my high school basketball coach would require us before every practice began and after every practice ended to shoot 50 free throws. In the beginning, we were kind of hyped up and ready to get practice, and we were shooting our 50 free throws, but then after a little while, like 10, 20, you're sort of ready to get on to the practice, the more exciting things. Um, you're sort of like, I know how to do this. I know how to shoot a free throw, and then a little along the way, you go, well, maybe I'm not as good as I thought I was. And then after the practice, then when we're really tired and really exhausted, and we're probably less likely to make the free throws, he said, do it again. Shoot 50 free throws again. We were all really annoyed by that, but as the season progressed, as life went on, our free throw percentage went up and our ability to win games at the free throw line went up. And why? Because we did the monotonous, some say boring, 
unexcitable practice that we thought we had figured out, that we thought was easy and all the rest of it because he trained us in the basics and disciplines and practices of basketball. And when it mattered, it paid off. When it mattered. Maybe you feel that way in worship. We do the same things over again and say the creed and sing the thing and all the rest of it. But when it matters, when it matters, those hymns will be in your heart to call to mind. And those scriptures will hopefully be in your heart to call to mind. And when you stand up and when you sit down and when you're with some, when, when, when things are going rough, those things are at the ready because you have done them over and over again. You have been here and trained for the life. I read this morning of a woman. I hope you will look this story up. I read it briefly. Um, this woman's name is Julia Hawkins. She just died in the last day or two at 108 years old. 108 years old. And just a year, two, three ago, I don't know how, in her 100s, um, she was the fastest sprinter in the Senior Olympics. They have these categories. Senior Olympics, maybe over the age of 80, something like that. They have these categories. And they had this beautiful picture of her running down the track. And it was so inspiring. I thought, how in the world? They, the article said her family told her you should run, you should run in this, this race. And, and when I was reading the article, when I first read that, I thought, what in the world occurred to them to tell their 100-year-old mother that she should run a sprint in a race? But as I read down in the article, she had been a competitive cyclist in her 80s. <laughs> she had been training for that. <laughs> so, so then I thought, this probably a reach for anybody over 100, but I thought it was less of a reach for her because when, when her body began, when her body was weakest and when uh, you, somebody thought she couldn't do it, when it really mattered, but she had trained, talked about how she ate her vegetables and her fruit and all that kind of stuff too, and she had exercised all the way into Elodie, and, and and when they had that idea, she jumped on it because she had trained and she was able to do it. She just wake up one day and try to do it. It matters in life also. When the layoff comes at work, when mama dies, when the kid goes off to the wild unknown of college, when everything around us is changing and confusing and disoriented, we have to be trained up to live um, to live our lives. As some of our ancestors would say, we have to be prayed up. Prayed up in regular worship, song, silence, service to others, because when it matters, we have to have that relationship with Christ to lean on, to give us fulfillment, to give us purpose, and not just us, not just, it's not just something for us, to give God glory to give God glory for our salvation in Jesus Christ, for the grace that Paul talks about with Timothy, to give God glory, to give God pleasure, to please God with how we're using what God has given us. Practice the free throws. Run the laps. Read the scripture. Say the prayers. Sing the songs. Do what we know to do. Because whatever life throws at us, we will have practiced and trained in holiness and godliness. Will you bow with me in prayer? God of all creation, God of each of us, thank you for giving us a second chance today to train, to begin, to start over, God, thank you for giving us the equipment to do that, your word, your Holy Spirit, uh, this time of worship. And Lord, thank you for giving us the world outside, a place that we can 
Um, We can serve and have purpose when we give glory to you. So help us to do that uh, when we go from this place. Help us to see and find purpose in the things that you put in front of us. Give us the grace and remind us of the gifts that you've given us to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.